So just diving straight in, uh, I want to talk a little bit about your background and your education, um, and maybe you could talk a little bit more about that, how it shaped you today, particularly with your work in journalism. Okay, um, so uh, hello everyone, uh, thank you very much for coming. So I was born in Kampala, Uganda, um, and I'm the only one in my family who was. My brother and my sister were born in Nairobi. Um, and I grew up in Nairobi until I was eight, and my parents moved to London. Um, and at the time, so this was 1970, um, and I, my father's residency permit came up for renewal, and he had the choice either to renew it and stay in Nairobi, or go to go back to Pakistan, which is where he. Uh, had spent most of his uh, life yeah. uh, and before that my father was born in Delhi so he was oh. part of the migration at partition yeah. and he moved to um, to Pakistan uh, in 1947 so when I moved to London I, I often think about what my life might have been like had my father made a different decision and decided to go back to Pakistan instead of go to London and and having been to Pakistan um, a few times I I can see how different my life would have been. That's not to say that I wouldn't have become a journalist, um, but I think my opportunities might have been slightly more constrained. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so I grew up in South London yes. from the age of eight. Uh, went to a primary school in South London, went to a state school, a comprehensive okay. in South London, and it was expected that I would get married and have an arranged marriage and I grew up in a relatively strict, I wouldn't say orthodox, but relatively yeah. strict Muslim family and there was no expectation that I would uh, have a career, mm -hmm. none whatsoever. And that was really the, the beginning of the battle yes. for me. Yes. Um, Absolutely. And I kind, I do see it as a battle actually because I think it was, it was a fight. Yeah. It was a fight with my father. Um, who didn't want me to become a journalist. I think mainly because he didn't know what journalism was. Oh. So, um, he's a very smart man, but didn't really go to school. Yeah. Um, taught himself how to read and write, oh. and worked on the railway. So, you know, my background is, is working class. Mm -hmm. um, and I think he didn't understand what I was interested in and why I was interested in it. But when I was 14 or 15, I used to buy the Guardian newspaper with the small amount of money that my mother gave me to spend on sweets. <laughs> and, um, and the reason I did that was that I had a very good English teacher at school who um, used to work on the Times. And he said, you should read a newspaper. And I said, what shall I read? And he said, whatever you like, why don't you go try things out? So I did, and I alighted on The Guardian, because every Tuesday in The Guardian, there was a column by a man called James Cameron. Oh. <laughs> and James was uh, a highly distinguished farm correspondent, and uh, had, had done pretty much all his reporting before he was given the column. And in the column, he would reflect on his life as a foreign correspondent. <laughs> and he would write about places that I had never heard of. Um, so he wrote about the Biafran War, and, you know, I didn't even know where Biafra was until I read the column. Um, so, you know, bear in mind I was 15. Yeah, exactly. And the only thing I did at school, I read and I was in a gang. So I was very naughty. <laughs> I was quite rebellious. <laughs> and, um, and so the only thing that connected me to the world was reading newspapers. Everything else felt like it was small in my world and um, and I I think I knew pretty much I would say six months into reading a newspaper I knew I wanted to be the person that was writing the stuff that I was reading Absolutely. Um, and that that was really that was a revelation mm -hmm. and then came the possibility of thinking about, well, just the prospect of thinking about how I would go about that. And I had never, you know, I didn't know anyone who was a journalist apart from my teacher who wasn't a journalist now. Yeah. You know, he was a teacher. Um, and so that, you know, that was really problematic. I, I didn't really know how to think about it. So instead I focused on being in a gang. <laughs> I read, I read lots, but I just, I just kind of was very naughty and didn't study. Absolutely. 
Well, I think a lot of people can, can relate to that, um, even if they're in different circumstances than you were in. Um, so, you were the BBC's arts correspondent, if I'm correct, for a decade, yes, I believe. that's right. Um, but now you're the foreign correspondent. Well, I'm not really a foreign correspondent now, so okay. I, present, I present two programmes on the BBC. Okay. So, um, I mean, they're both connected to foreign affairs. So, one of them is called News Hour on the BBC mm -hmm. World yes. Service. They're both radio programmes. The other mm -hmm. one is The World Tonight on Radio 4. So they're both international current affairs programs, mm -hmm. and so uh, just very, very quickly. So my yeah. career at the BBC started in international news. I started okay. at the World Service in the newsroom. I spent, I would say, about nine or ten years doing that. Mm -hmm. During which time I worked in Pakistan as a foreign correspondent, yes. um, and worked in Sri Lanka mm -hmm. also as a foreign correspondent. Then I came back from Sri Lanka and uh, persuaded the BBC to create a post of arts correspondent at the World Service. Mm. One didn't exist. Mm -hmm. they, they had a Radio 4, no, they had a television arts correspondent, but mm. no, no World Service arts correspondent. So I persuaded them to create the post. Mm. I then applied for the post, and I was the first person in the post, which was lovely. Um, and then I think Radio 4 saw the efficacy of this particular post, mm. and then they created a Radio 4 arts correspondent. Gotcha. I also applied for that job and yes. was the first person in that post. Mm -hmm. And then the person who did the television arts job, a woman called Rosie Millard, who I think had had that job for about 10 years, she yeah. left and I have to admit that I, you know, I can see why people would be really cross about this, but I didn't have to interview for that. I was yeah. just given that job. Oh, okay. So I had, I had never done any television. So oh. that was slightly terrifying yeah, because I'd only done radio up until that point and when Rosie left... Oh, oh dear. Should we change that? It's okay. We've got... Thanks, Lucy. Um, so when Rosie left and they offered me they offered me that job, I, I said, oh, you know, I've never done any television before, don't you? Yeah. And they said, you'll be fine. Yeah, of course. <laughs> and I said, okay, let's see how that goes. Anyway, so I stayed doing that for 10 years, yes. which was... Um, a dream job. I mean, really, really, really yeah. incredible. You know, I'd had my my dream was to be a foreign correspondent, yes. right? So I had done a little bit of that, but there was also an incident in Sri Lanka in which uh, me and my boyfriend at the time uh, were nearly killed, and I changed my mind about wanting to be a foreign correspondent. Yeah, well, how about you? Uh, well, I mean, a lot of people wouldn't, but I think it, it's, it, was a, it was a watershed moment because it helped me decide what kind of person I was. You know, you either have the, the required adrenaline and desire to continue to be in those places yeah. or you make a decision that that's not really for you. Yes. And I don't think it's about... I don't think it's about courage, it's not about mm -hmm. cowardice, it's not about any of those things. It's about the extent to which you want to continue to put yourself in danger. Yeah. Um, and I really admire the people who have the ability to not be like me and to uh, continue to do that. I yeah. think it's, and it's necessary, you yeah. know, we Absolutely. need people like that. So I'm just not one of them. Yeah, um, it's a certain breed. Definitely. Yeah, and also, you know, when I really thought we were going to die, all I kept thinking was, I'm 30 years old, I want to have children. Yeah. I do not want to die in Sri Lanka. Absolutely. So that was my, that was my thing, right? And that was the turning point, yeah, right? Absolutely. I just thought, actually, I don't want to do this. Yeah. And I can do, I can be a journalist in a different way. Um, and thank goodness there are lots of different ways of being a journalist. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, so you talked a bit earlier about this ongoing fight, and in the panel yesterday you talked about this ongoing fight for women's voices to be heard. Um, just why exactly is this so important to you, besides the obvious reasons? Uh, and why should we all, as a society, champion this endeavor? Um, well, you know, sometimes the obvious reasons are the ones that have to be stated <coughs> most yes. clearly. Yes. Um, and I just think any any project to build a society has to include making sure that people are able to fulfill their potential. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it's not really an endeavor worth 
pursuing and, mm -hmm. and if you're not going to be involved and engaged in some way and I, by that I don't mean you have to be an activist or mm -hmm. you have to be a vocal public champion of these things you know you can you can do these things privately quietly within your own sphere mm -hmm. and your own ambit and, and I, I just really believe that the smallest of steps that individuals make mm -hmm. contribute to change in society yeah. even if you can I mean I think this about reading you know mm -hmm. I if, if one book transforms the sensibility of the person who's read it mm -hmm than the person who wrote it has succeeded. Exactly. And, and it doesn't, you know, of course, every writer wants to have the largest audience. Every broadcaster wants to have the greatest number of people that they can reach and so on. But I, I just think that we have to believe in the individual's ability to quietly um, engender change. And, and that matters to me hugely. And I think that you can do that in, in very small ways in, in, in your own relationships with friends, with family, mm -hmm. with colleagues, Absolutely. you know, to constantly feel that you, and that's why it's a battle, because actually you have to think all the time about how you're going to challenge the status quo. If the status quo is not working for everyone, mm -hmm. then how do you change it? Absolutely. Um, so that's why it matters to me that, mm -hmm. that you know, I, I'm nervous of um, the politics of identity being the thing that informs all of us but it is what it is and a lot of people regard themselves as having multiple identities mm -hmm. so you know I I'm a mother I was a wife I'm not anymore um, I am a journalist I'm a woman mm -hmm. I'm a friend <laughs> I'm you know I'm many things Absolutely. to many people yeah. and my you know my world the more I define it in that way the bigger my world becomes mm -hmm. You know, I'm a citizen as opposed to a subject. Mm -hmm. um, my choice to be an engaged citizen is entirely dependent on me and my sense of my duties and my responsibilities. So, you know, being 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 a woman of colour in the United Kingdom in the 21st century presents itself with some challenges yes. and some you know, significant amounts of navigation. Mm -hmm. But I don't think that that's particularly exceptional. There are many people who face exactly the same things, but they have a different set of identities. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, growing up in South London in the 1970s was not easy. There was an awful lot of racism. Yeah. And my abiding memory of being an 11 year old, I was bullied mercilessly at school by racist, a gang of racist girls. Mm -hmm. And it could account for why I joined a gang. Um, and you know, our need to belong is so visceral. And it wasn't, you know, I'm not proud of the things that I did in the gang, you know. We, I don't, you know, we weren't, had we been given the chance, we would have been violent, mm -hmm. I think. Okay. Um, but we were aggressive. Yeah, absolutely. You know, you were angry. The, yeah, and the kind of collective, collective psyche of a group of people who feel, you know, aggrieved. Mm -hmm. Or we had nothing to be aggrieved about, frankly. Mm -hmm. You know, we were just a bunch of schoolgirls in a state comprehensive. You know, we yeah. just, we just fancied ourselves. We just thought we were something. Everyone can relate to that. <laughs> you know, and, and it's, you know, I, I think people should talk about these things honestly. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, I go to schools and I talk to, to students about this sort of thing, you know, my mm -hmm. career. And, and the first time I went back to the school I was at, mm -hmm. the teachers were present mm -hmm. and the hall was full mm -hmm. and I started talking about being in a gang. Yeah. And there was like this collective sharp intake of breath from the yeah. teachers. It was like, oh, we thought we were inviting someone who's going to be talking about journalism and elevated things. And and I, you know, and I just thought, you know what? We can't, we can't afford to to be dishonest yes, about um, about the lives that we lead yeah. in order to in order to kind of gloss over some. I don't know. Present a persona. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm not interested in that. Yeah. What is hard work? is being different things for different people. Mm -hmm. So creating facades for mm -hmm. your work colleagues, you know, 
the, the group of people that you feel that you don't belong to, mm -hmm. you know, some elite group at the BBC or whatever. <laughs> you know, and I, I think it's so much easier to be yourself. Yeah. And so therefore, the project to understand yourself is that much more important. And you don't have to talk about it, you just do it. You know, we are all developing all the time and learning mm -hmm. all the time. And, you know, I'm 56 next month and I feel like I'm learning all the time. Uh, all yeah. the time. Mm -hmm. I Absolutely. don't ever feel that I know things. Mm -hmm. I prefer to be ambivalent. I prefer to be uncertain mm -hmm. in order to feel that I can add knowledge constantly. Absolutely. Anyway, that was such a long-winded answer and I don't even think amazing. I answered the question. <laughs> no, I mean, that actually kind of bounces onto my next question. You kind of sort of answered it already, but you know, how does being a female in this industry specifically has it affected you personally in your own fight to be heard? Uh, yes. So I have been uh, I've been involved in um, the campaign inside the BBC for equal pay. Mm. Mm. Um, so a year ago, the BBC was. I mean, legally there are obligations now for any organisation in the UK that uh, employs more than two hundred and fifty people mm. to. Or maybe it's one hundred and fifty, two hundred and fifty. Uh, to, um, yeah, it's 250 people, but they have to publicly declare the earnings of anyone uh, who earns more than £150,000. Mm. And because the BBC is a public body, um, the, the pressure on it to preempt the legal requirement to do so came uh, this time last year, just over a year ago, July, oh, wow. July 2017. So they published these figures of everyone who earned more than 150,000 mm -hmm. and it created a huge ruckus mm -hmm. because they were significant women mm -hmm. uh, who were doing comparable or the same jobs mm -hmm. as men and mm -hmm. were earning considerably less, in some cases 50% less. I mean like really, really egregious yeah. um, sums of money and um, deep inequality that was being um, revealed. So I um, joined a group of women, most of whom are far, far, far better known than I am, much higher profiles than me uh, publicly, and um, I have been involved with that group for more than a year now, and Carrie Gracie, who was the BBC's China editor, she led the way in terms of challenging the BBC. She wrote an open letter, which was published in the national newspaper, and uh, in which she challenged the public to challenge the BBC, <laughs> uh, which was a fantastic strategy, uh, basically saying, you own the BBC, this is what the BBC is doing. Um, I mean, I'm not saying anything that isn't in the public domain, it was an open letter that was uh, sent to the national press. Um, and as a result of that letter, uh, Carrie gave evidence to the Select Committee, um, the media um, Select Committee at the House of Commons, and I was involved in helping um, her in that. So I think that the reason I'm just explaining it a little bit is that, the, that it's important to have the context of it, but that moment inside the BBC mm -hmm. did manifest itself in a group of women coming together having felt that they had not had a voice inside the corporation and I if any of you are interested I would urge you to read a fantastic piece in the New Yorker written by a woman called Lauren Collins she it was a big piece it's like it's called Letter from London or something but it was a huge piece looking at the the movement if you like I mean it's a small movement but the movement of women inside the BBC to um, demand equal pay mm. as opposed to fair pay yeah there's a difference there's a big difference, <laughs> there's a big difference. absolutely um, so yeah in the context of, of, of that um, issue mm -hmm. I've definitely felt that there has been a there's been a, a there's been a shift you know mm -hmm. the BBC has had to acknowledge that they have not paid absolutely. people fairly and carry won the most astonishing settlement um, mm -hmm. from the BBC um, to the tune of uh, hundreds of thousands of pounds mm -hmm. and that's the extent to which she was not being paid equally and she gave all the money away mm -hmm. to uh, a charity called the Fawcett Society okay. and um, also to a legal team to help 
women who don't earn as much as she does mm -hmm. to fight their cases. Absolutely. Um, she's a woman of real integrity. Cool. Um, one final question before we open it up. Um, what advice would you give to any woman out there who are struggling in their own fight to be heard? If anything. It's a big question. Yeah, it is. I mean, it depends, it depends what the fight is, right? Yeah. I mean, I, I would say, without hesitation, find women who you can talk to. Mm. Find people that you can talk to. Straighten you know. the numbers. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Uh, find people that you can seek advice from. Uh, be bolder than you are. Mm. Um, only because, you know, I, I know that not everyone is robust mm -hmm. and not everyone has the same levels of resilience mm -hmm. to fight. Mm -hmm. And it's quite easy to feel knocked back and then think, I'm not going to try anymore. Yeah. Um, and I understand that. Yeah. Which is why I think it's useful to, to, to find sympathetic ears mm -hmm. and people who can support you. And then you can feel that you're building robustness and resilience in yourself if you are if you happen to be a quiet person if you happen to be a shy person you know those those are battles that you have to fight if you're a man or a woman yeah, right absolutely. i mean these these are just human things so mm -hmm. so the only way that you can overcome them is by first of all knowing yourself mm -hmm. recognizing these things about yourself recognizing your strengths as well as your weaknesses and once mm -hmm. you recognize your weaknesses you can attempt to try and mitigate them by focusing on your strengths. Um, so I would say have the courage to be bolder than you are, which means taking a much bigger step than you might feel you are able to, and rarely than you are capable of, right? Mm -hmm. Most women, in my experience, will look at the requirements in a job spec, and of the six requirements, mm -hmm. if they don't fulfill five or six they won't yeah. apply yeah. whereas most men will look at the job spec and if they fulfill two out of six okay. they'll say i can ring it, it. i'm yeah. going to apply and Absolutely. i think that's really interesting yeah. I, that's what i mean about being bold. Yeah. think about your skill set in a different way mm -hmm. to what is being presented to you on a page mm -hmm. think about your ability to communicate yeah think about your ability to analyze all the things that actually the job spec may not specifically identify mm -hmm. but will allow you to um, completely and utterly master the three that you don't have absolutely I, I would guarantee it and women underestimate themselves and their capabilities yes. consistently mm -hmm. it's a mind game yeah <laughs> and absolutely. I and I think that is is important to try and try and overcome that's anyway. great okay um, I think we've got time for questions yes and we got a mic thank you uh, thank you, Mr. Iqbal, for that really, really fascinating um, talk. My question to you is, um, if I were to ask you, not as a woman, but as a human being, what are some of the most difficult challenges you face in your career and how you have overcome them? Would they be different than the challenges that you would identify if I were to ask you if you were a woman, what were the challenges you faced? One, that's my first question. And second, the well, let me answer that one yes. first before you think of the second one. That's a great question. Um, so I, I would kind of go back to that answer when I was talking about the multiple identities that people have. You know, I don't walk into work thinking I am a woman of colour of a particular age. I am a mother. I, I, I never walk into work thinking that. I always walk into work thinking. I wonder what the stories are today. What am I going to be presenting program, the program about, right? So, so you're right to identify just being human. And, and the bottom line in that context then is my character, right? The only thing that I am going to be judged on, the only two things I think I'm going to be judged on are, are my character and my professionalism. Mm -hmm. And one in a way feeds into the other because I present two live news programs and the amount of stress and pressure that you're under really does test your ability to work in a team. Because if you're under pressure and you don't deal with pressure particularly well, you are much more likely to shout, 
you are much more likely to blame other people. You are much more likely to freak out. Um, and so I, I do think that those, those things are much, much more important than those are the challenges that I face on a daily basis. You know, the, so for, for example, um, we are on air at two o'clock in the afternoon for News Hour and the World Service. So our biggest audience at that time is on the east coast of America. It's a nine mm -hmm. o'clock show in the morning. And um, there was one particular day, uh, we record the top of the program, the first minute of the program, we mostly record. If we can't, there isn't time, we do it live. And then the rest of the program is live. And we're on air for two hours. And I walked into the studio at midday to record uh, the billboard, as it's known. And about half past 12, quarter to one, uh, I looked at my computer screen and there was a flash that Margaret Thatcher had died. Mm -hmm. And I said to the studio director, uh, so I think we might have to re-record the billboard. And he said, no, he said it was perfectly fine. And of course he wasn't looking at the same screen as I was. Mm -hmm. And I said, mm. I said, I don't think we have a program. Margaret Thatcher's just died. We're going to have to redo the whole program. So bear in mind, we've been working since nine o'clock in the morning to do the program that we thought we were going to be presenting. And in that moment, for the next hour and a half before we were on air, the entire running order was thrown out the window. So we had to redo the program. And we had nothing. I had written nothing. We went on air with the producer and the editor in my ear saying, so we've got F.W. de Klerk coming up next. We've got Jerry Adams next. We've got this minister next. We've got that minister next. I had nothing in front of me. Now, you could argue that I'm slowly giving myself a stomach ulcer and God knows what else. However, the test for me is for me to stay calm on air and to not get annoyed with the editor for not giving me enough information. For you know, so, so those are the challenges that are bigger. You know, all those other things are, are nuanced and more subtle and arise on a day-to-day -day basis. You know, being a woman and, and not feeling that you have a voice or feeling that men shut you down in meetings, which happens all the time. Men, very often, I mean, even enlightened men at the BBC, goodness me, um, will assume that they can answer your question before you've even finished asking it or feel in some way that you don't you don't have the right to say what you're going to say. And, you know, I, I, I'm in a job now where I do have a voice because I present the program. Uh, obviously, literally, I have a voice, but I also, I also, there's a status accorded to presenters so that I have editorial input. I can... You know, and people don't shut me down. So th there isn't that side of it. But I think your question is is so important in the context of how we conduct ourselves as human beings as opposed to constantly thinking about ourselves through the prism of particular identities. Because sometimes it's not helpful. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's so much better. Because when I walk into that building, I I'm not a woman first. I'm a journalist. Right. And, and that... Anyway, your second question. Yeah. I, I, I think I've answered yeah. it. Yeah. Really quickly. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, can you give us a few thoughts on the state of affairs of journalism right now? I mean, we've got all this talk of fake news, and you're seeing the way the news is being propagated in the United States of America. I come from Afghanistan, where I believe only 5% of what I hear from the news stations locally. Um, a few words on the state of affairs of journalism right now. <laughs> Go. Oh my God. Um, okay, so I do think that we are living in possibly the most challenging of, of times in the context of, um, of truth. You know, the importance of truth and how it is defined is, it is critical. You know, I, I'm reluctant to even say the word fake news. I don't like giving it legitimacy. I think it's a construct and we have to continually, as journalists, as citizens, as active, engaged human beings, we have to think that way. Because semantics is a really big part of how cultural change happens. So if you have the world's most powerful politician continually talking about fake news and everybody else, you've just mentioned it, you know, you're asking me to talk about it, 
I think it does give it legitimacy. So I like to, obviously you can't ignore it because it comes up all the time, or when Rudy Giuliani says, truth isn't the truth. I mean, what the hell does that mean, even? Mm -hmm. um, and so language becomes much more important. 